Good morning. Julie Bangeter Beck, the 15th Relief Society General President, was a full-time homemaker when she was called to serve on the Young Women General Board. During her service in the Young Women and Relief Society General Presidencies, she traveled approximately one million miles, gave more than 500 talks, and averaged 15 messages a week. Heavily involved in general church responsibilities, Sister Beck has served on the Executive and General Councils for Church Welfare, the Church Board of Education, the Board of Trustees of the Church Schools and Universities, the Perpetual Education Fund, the Perpetual Education Board, and the LDS Family Services Board. Sister Beck chaired the committee to revise personal progress and directed the writing and publication of the book, Daughters in My Kingdom, the history and work of the Relief Society. Some of her most influential addresses were Mothers Who Know, Teaching the Doctrine of the Family, The Vision of Prophets Regarding Relief Society, and what I hope my granddaughters and grandsons will understand about Relief Society. Sister Beck has been a piano teacher, a PTA president, a volunteer for various events and cele celebrations, and co-chair for her local America's Junior Miss program. In 2012, Governor Gary Herbert appointed Sister Beck to serve on the Board of Trustees of Dixie State University, where she was previously inducted into the school's Hall of Fame in the area of public and college service. She and her husband, Ramon, have three children. Her late father, Elder William Grant Bangeter, received the Emeriti Special Recognition Award in, in 2007. The Becks enjoy family activities, driving their Jeep Wrangler, sitting outside on summer nights, and taking early morning walks. Thank you so much for welcoming here, me here today. I don't know why this slide is up right now, but we might as well look at it and get it over with. This is a picture of me on the day I graduated from Brigham Young University. And when I made a copy of this photo and uh, gave it to Elder Holland, he said, who's the lady with all the hair? <laughs> you need to know that the, the sister that's over on uh, you're right, is Barbara B. Smith, the General Relief Society president. She was attending commencement exercises that day and her, her role as a member of the Board of Trustees. And she was always well known for having big hair. So I out, out did her that day in the, in the area of hair. And uh, Elder Holland was the president of BYU at the time. And President Monson was here as an apostle. That was a picture my husband snapped just as I was walking past to get in the big lineup and go up to the walk-in. So imagine when I found this about six years ago in our stack of slides and thought, wow, there are two Relief Society presidents in that picture and we, we didn't know. You can tell that Elder Holland and Sister Smith didn't know they were even in the picture. <laughs> but I made copies for everybody and framed them. <laughs> Thank you. Now we can darken the screen. We're not doing slides again for a minute. I appreciate Dean Ogle so much and uh, for this honor and have appreciated getting to know him better. He tells me that I was on the Board of Trustees when we approved his appointment here. And then Ann Baxter's helped him so much. This is a great honor for me. I never saw myself and never have seen myself as someone uh, needing or deserving honors. I just have served and worked out of duty and responsibility and trying to do the best I could every day, like most of you, I hope. And it's a lot of pressure having my family here. A number, I sent out an email and they all wanted to come, which then you say, oh, they're going to be there. <laughs> and they know all my uh, faults and my warts, and so I have to be a little bit careful about what I say. But I hope this message will have meaning for my grandchildren especially and my nieces and nephews who are still uh, rising stars. They're amazing people in my book and, and I hope what I say can be a blessing to them. I was asked to be somewhat autobiographical in this message and less technical, so that's the direction we're going. I'm not going to open up the scriptures and give you a, a lot of doctrine today, but talk a little bit about my journey at BYU and how it's impacted my life. 
I was a very non-traditional BYU student. I came here as a transfer student with an associate of science degree from Dixie College, as it was then. And Dixie was a very small school. It had about 2,500 students, and the freeway between Salt Lake and California hadn't been finished yet. So the main pastime for the Dixie boys was dragging the boulevard every night. There wasn't a lot happening in St. George, but Dixie was good for me. And I came here as a newlywed. I never lived in Provo. I didn't live on campus. I didn't date anybody here. I married my young single adult representative that I sat next to in Sunday school. <laughs> so I came one semester and... Uh, when I graduated, I had two children, a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and so my experience doesn't uh, match up with a lot of the, with any of the experience my children have and with the majority of BYU students. But I have thought as I prepared this about experiences and the experience people have. Often we think we're going through the motions of something until the big experience happens and we're just marking time and then the adventure we've dreamed of and planned on when we were younger will take place somehow magically out of what's happening in daily life. And we think that the dreams we have are going to be realized a certain way and then things turn out a different way. As the Relief Society General President, I often uh, started messages with a question and answer time. Then we could work on their questions. And if there's time at the end of this, maybe we'll give you some time for questions. But I was struck by how, um, how people's experiences affected them. And oftentimes people would say, I, I wish I had a husband. And then somebody else would say, in essence, I wish I had a different husband. And then they'd say, I wish I had children. And then some people wanted different children. And, and they weren't quite having the dream that they hoped for. They were, what they were having was the experience. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the beginning of our recorded history. Adam and Eve started out with a certain opportunity and they ended up with a completely different experience in their lives. And Adam reflected on that. This is in Moses chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, when he said, because of his transgression, and I like to say because of his mortal experience, then he learned some things. He, his eyes were opened. And he learned to have joy, and he understood that he would see God again in the flesh. And then Eve reflected on that. And she said that because of her transgression, or in other words, her mortal experience, that she was able to have children. And wouldn't you like to read the volumes Eve could have said about that <laughs> and her experience of being a mother? And she also said that she had learned the difference between good and evil and the joy of her redemption and eternal life which was promised her. So Adam and Eve got a mortal experience and they reflected on some of the things they learned. They started out with a simple instruction from the Lord to be fruitful. And that's the instruction we all have. Be fruitful. You don't need a manual to remember that. You can carry it around in your head. I think how wise the Lord was to give them a path for their life that they could carry around in their own head without a manual, without an institute teacher, without a BYU religion class, without a high priest group leader. They just had to have that in their minds to be fruitful. And out of that, they would multiply and replenish and subdue and have dominion and dress and keep. There were other instructions, but they had that one thought in their minds and then a lot happened throughout that experience for them. So as I think back on my own life, I think what an experience. My higher education experience actually began before I was born. Now I, I don't know if you can stand up, mother, but I'm going to do what you always do. You, she usually says stand up to the people in the family, but ra wave your hand so they know where you are. Mother turned 90 this year. And she can actually walk, but when we want to hurry, we put her in the chair. <laughs> so she's still uh, the great brain of our family. When she and our father were dating, then um, they, 
actually this was on their honeymoon, they started to make some goals for their family and she said they wrote them on a paper sack and then threw away the sack, but they remembered the, the goals. And one of those goals was that all of their children would graduate from university. So think about that. You're on your honeymoon and you decide this is what we're going to do as a family. And dad says, well, I'm a poor man. I can't pay for it. So mom wrote work <laughs> under that. Okay, we have to teach our children to work, which they did in a variety of ways. But they didn't know that their family would grow to include 10 children. So you think of that goal that never moved and the challenges each child had, but they wanted that dream for their children. And they didn't know they were going to be in the university business for 25 years. They didn't know all the jobs their children were going to have to get to earn the money for that education and the sacrifices the family would have to make. But it was the family goal. Now, eight of my nine siblings are here, and so I want you to please stand. All my siblings. Are they? Well, Howard's not here. We're missing him. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? Can I count still? Who are we missing? Peggy and Howard and Lane. Lane's in Idaho. Okay, Jay, you can stand up. Jay's representing my youngest brother. <laughs> and Lisa, you stand representing Howard. Okay. So all 10 of us graduated from Brigham Young University. Isn't that great? Now, the first sacrifice my parents made was sending us here because they were both U of U graduates. <laughs> but they did have this vision that we, we should come here. Now, the spouses. Lisa already standed, but I'd like my uh, sibling spouses who attended BYU to stand. Okay, so that tells a little bit of the other story. And then grandchildren who are here, who attend or graduated from BYU. Okay. All right. So raise your hand if you're my child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That just, we've had uh, about 20 grandchildren from my, of my parents graduate from the Y. About 20 have graduated from other institutions of higher learning and it's been a big family effort and each one of these siblings could tell their own story here. So I really feel that this is our award because I didn't do it alone, they didn't do it alone, but we all helped make it happen, excuse me. That's not in the script <laughs> to get emotional, but I thought this morning this is our award and our honor because of our parents' vision. I often had poor health as a child, which meant I missed a lot of school, which meant I got behind on some skills. And when it came time to take the college entrance exams, I didn't score very well, so my high school counselor told me to go learn a skill and do something else. But I've always been a poor secretary, so that was out. <laughs> and um, I didn't know what to do, but I did know that my parents had this goal, and I thought, I don't care what you say. <laughs> I'm going to go to college. My parents were big believers in starting out in smaller schools, and I had visited my sister in Rexburg during the winter, and so that was out. <laughs> And my parents had connections in St. George at the time. My father bought a, a mobile home and put it right in the middle of a retirement community. And we filled it with college-age girls, and away we went in, in St. George, Utah. We were the talk of that little neighborhood. It was a fun time. Dixie was great for me. And when it came time to go to school, I didn't have any money. But my older sister, Glenda, Raise your hand again. Glenda was preparing to serve a mission, and she said, if you will make my dresses, then whatever money's left, you can have. So when she left on her mission, she gave me her savings passbook. 
and she had a closet full of dresses. And, and off I went to Dixie and got a job on campus and I lived the real college life down there. I was active in institute, I was a student body officer and after a year and a half I graduated and got married. And the day we got married we drove from the temple in Salt Lake down here to Provo and paid our tuition and we had three dollars left and a month till payday. So we moved in with Grandpa and drove our old Plymouth and we had the miracle of the loaves and fishes or the crews of oil because every time we needed gas we uh, went and checked all of our pockets and we'd always find just enough to put gas in the car and come and I realized years later that change has to come from somewhere and we never had a dollar to make change with so it was a miracle that first month that we had the gas money to get to school it was pretty intense with both of us working full time and and going to school and after that first semester we were out of money so I quit and went to work and after a year, few years then the pressure to finish school began to build because younger siblings started coming to BYU and they started to uh, graduate and I knew that I really needed to fulfill that dream so again Glenda stepped in to help she said I know you want to finish and I'll watch your children and uh, she took on an extra one-year-old and three-year-old and I started in. I came back to BYU and sat with the director of admissions and it still makes me mad when I talk about this <laughs> because when I showed him my degree and I showed him my transcript he said it wouldn't count. He said we have higher standards here than they have in St. George and um, then he asked the question that still rankles <laughs> And we don't have any administrators like this at BYU anymore. He was a wonderful man. Everybody admired him. He wrote books and everything. But it still rankles that he said to me, can you stand before the judgment bar of God and say you know all that material? <sighs> I wanted to ask him if he could stand before the judgment bar <laughs> and say he knew everything he said he knew. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, many of my credits were slashed, and so it was almost a, a do-over to come back to BYU. So I sat down with the counselor, and I said, here's the credits BYU will accept, and what is the fastest way out of here? <laughs> so they gave me about three degree options. I chose child development and family relationships because it fit in with my career at the time, which was being a wife and a mother, and we registered, paid down the money, and I started class. I determined at the time that I'd come three days a week and we always I always took a full load 18 hours because that's where you got the best bang for your dollar and we didn't have money to waste so I had to get out in the shortest amount of time that was a lot of pressure so I'd come I get up before the family woke up on Monday Wednesday Friday and I'd get home when they were asleep but the other days I didn't take any books out of the closet I did my other responsibilities. The time I was here, I was primary president the entire f that five years, and our ward was divided four times. I don't know if you know what that means, but it's not fun. <laughs> um, Mother Glenda watched the children, and Mother fixed a bologna sandwich every day, and I swung by my parents' home and loaded up the car with siblings, and we came over together. Now raise your hand if you went to school in my family with me. Paulo, Jelaine, Grant, if Howard was here and Peggy, I came here with five of my siblings and we had our own little corner of the library where we studied. You could always find one of us there and we always ate our bologna sandwich and I never liked bologna. I haven't eaten a sandwich made of bologna since. <laughs> <laughs> But I, if I, I knew if I said something to Mother, then she'd make something special for me, and so I just ate bologna <laughs> while I came to, to BYU. It was the, you know, she laid them out on the cabinet and did it assembly style. But um, during those years also, Ramon was in the National Guard, and so he was gone a lot of weekends. And I'd go a semester and be out a semester. And when I was out, then I'd do an independent study class or two. 
and try and chip away. Ramon typed every single paper, which I hand wrote because we did not have computers. The only computer BYU had at the time would fit in this room, so that's how it was. Ramon, stand up and take your bow right here. <laughs> He's a very good typist and is fast, and so it worked best that way. Anyway, <laughs> it was actually very fun to come back to campus uh, because when I came back as a, a mother and a wife and a primary president, and, and we built a home during those years too, it was, I knew what a priority was. It was different than when I was a young single student. I knew what a priority was, and I knew how to choose between different demands on my time. And I learned that I could compete academically. For the first time in my life, I was successful in school, and I loved it because I knew how to organize time. I knew I had better thinking skills. I knew how to apply myself better. I was a better communicator. And it was, so it was a thrilling time, really, to find out that I could really study and absorb material and learn. And I hadn't had that experience in all my childhood and in my educational experience before that. So really, I think it was a blessing for the Lord to delay that opportunity to a time when I could appreciate it and really learn those skills. I took classes... Um, that I loved, like children's literature and poetry, which we used, and my children memorized many poems that I got in that class. I loved my microbiology class. I had sick children, and I knew what a microbe was and how diseases were spread and, and how to solve those kinds of things. I loved the astronomy, and I loved relearning Portuguese. My last semester here was really the crucible. It was winter and cold, and right at midterm time, our ward was divided. I lost both counselors and 15 primary teachers. That same week, our son Joseph got two ear infections and pneumonia. And he was one sick boy. So I missed more than a week of school just taking care of life. And at the end of that week, I was behind I was ready to flunk out of midterm tests. I didn't have assignments finished, and it was impossible. It was too big of a hill to climb. And I was exhausted. So the alarm rang on the day I said I'd go back to school, and I turned over and turned it off and said I quit to myself. But my husband perked up his ears. He usually didn't do that. He usually slept through my exit. And he sat up and he said, what? He said, I've worked too hard for this degree. Get out there and go to school. <laughs> so I did it. I dragged through that week. We got through midterm somehow. And Joseph got better. And the board got organized. And it all was fine. But the last day on campus. I took my microbiology final and I walked out and there was a little mist of a rain coming down with the Y against the mountain and I thought the heavens are weeping for joy. We did it. It was wonderful. After that experience then life continued and we had another daughter I experienced a prolonged period of ill health. I participated in lots of community service and piano teaching, and my husband continued in the National Guard for 26 years. He went to graduate school. We did lots of church service, presidencies and bishoprics and scouting, and he was on the planning commission and the city council. And I, don't, I look back and I think, how did we do that and why did we do all that? Uh, we both worked at the MTC in a branch and, and uh, our children grew up and graduated from high school and came here to BYU and we started all over again with them and their challenges and they met their spouses here and that made our family even better and our grandchildren began to be born and now we're looking forward to them being here. So today we have 
Let's have Hope, Ellie, and Mariner stand. These are our three oldest grandchildren. And then we have Julia and Lily here. So these are five, five of our 16, well, we got Olivia there and baby in arms, so six of our 16 grandchildren. And we hope they're planning to come to BYU. We know Hope is, if Hope doesn't get here by next fall, then we're going to have a major tragedy in the family. <laughs> because she's been talking about it since she could talk. Thank you. Anyway, they're working hard and they're doing well in school and achieving things and doing all the things they need to do to prepare to qualify for entrance to BYU. Um, now, um, like I said, a lot of things have happened since then. I had the opportunity, let's see what we can do with these slides. Is this up now? These are just a few little reflections. Um, I've met world leaders. This is a day when, um, when I got to greet President Bush when he flew into Salt Lake City. But I put this one in because I loved being with the prophet and President Nukdorf when we toured Air Force One. That was great. I sat in the co-pilot, President Nukdorf in the pilot, and President uh, Monson behind me bossing everybody from the engineer's seat. So <laughs> I just remember when President Nukdorf was touching all the buttons up here, President Monson said, don't do it, Dieter, don't do it. <laughs> So that was a fun day. We, I've met many distinguished world leaders in a lot of different countries. This is BYU Hawaii commencement exercises. And I was there representing the First Presidency as a member of the Board of Trustees. Doing humanitarian work around the world. This is on a, the USS uh, Continuing Promise. It's, the USS Comfort, it's a Navy ship, hospital ship, that the church has partnered with doing humanitarian work at various ports. This was down in Panama and uh, with our LDS volunteers. That was an amazing experience to see that. To go to Tonga and other places and uh, Ghana, be able to mix with the members of the church in various cultures and learn how the church is growing to be part of publishing a book that went out in its first publication with over seven million copies. Now think of that. It took three months just to print it. Just to print it with the presses going every day for three months. Now I don't know if there's any very many books other than the Bible and the Book of Mormon that have had that many copies, but it was amazing and to participate in things such as radio and television and broadcasting, many radio programs. So those are just a few of the, of just a sampling of some of the things I was able to experience. Now, what would I have been able to experience and do and participate in if I hadn't pursued the goal to finish at BYU? I don't know that I could have done what I had to do because coming back to BYU gave me the confidence, the ability to learn and to study, and it gave me the credentials that were necessary to tackle huge problems and projects and many endeavors that required so much thought and study. What an amazing experience for a woman who shared $3 with her husband on the day she got married, just with an idea that we could maybe do something like this, that we could maybe accomplish this. My husband was the first university graduate in both lines of his family. And no one in his family had ever dreamed of going to a university. But he did. And that's one of the things I loved about him. So what are some of the lessons that I learned from my experience that I would share with my grandchildren? And there, this is just a sampling. It depends on the day, what comes into my mind, but these are what I've thought of this week. The first one is to be fruitful. That is still not a worn out piece of counsel. 
The Lord still wants us to be fruitful. We live in a world that discourages fruitfulness, that is increasing in apathy and anger and entitlement. And yet the Lord's way is to be fruitful. We should be multiplying our families, multiplying our talents and abilities, multiplying the good in the world. We should be replenishing and giving back and feeding and refueling. We should have dominion over the things that, that would pull us down and dominate the weak things of the world. We are here to have dominion, and dominion is leadership. We're meant to be leaders. That's what dominion means. To subdue, subdue the weaker parts of our nature. To subdue evil, there's a lot in that study. And when the Lord told Adam and Eve to dress and keep things in the garden, to improve them, to make them better, and to preserve, there is a lot to being fruitful. And none of that can happen without the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and the atonement of the Lord being right in the middle of it. Another lesson I have is that life is a battle against inertia. That physical law applies to so much in life. Starting is always more difficult than the journey. Getting up is always harder than keeping going. And so the battle against inertia is alive and well. We know and I've learned that work doesn't do itself. Talks don't write themselves, books don't publish themselves, big projects can only be accomplished by breaking them down into small bites and small pieces, and so just start taking some steps. And I was raised by a mother who believed in the principle of one, two, three, four. So one is get up and get on your knees and grab your scriptures and get dressed. So that's one, two, three, four. And part of getting dressed is make your bed. So that's, you know, you, you pray, you read your scriptures, you get dressed, you make your bed. That's how you fight inertia in this world. And the getting dressed and the making your bed are symbolic acts. They tell the Lord that you are up for the game. I'm ready for the day. I'm not going back there. I can do whatever you want me to face today. But if you don't make your bed, it sort of symbolically says, maybe not. Maybe there's an option to go back. So I love having a mother that said, make your bed. Because then you're done with that and you're on with your day. Um, another lesson is try to be happy. Pray to be happy. It saves time. You know you're going to be happy in the end. So save time by just Work at being happy now. My parents had a family motto that said, enjoy it. And my dad said, if you're going to enjoy it in 20 years, you might as well enjoy it now. So we know that crisis plus time equals humor. And you can laugh about a lot of things now and just shorten the time element. And I love that the Lord counseled us to be of good cheer. But try to be happy. Next, uh, life is a battle with priorities. You can say choosing between good, better, and best. Often I've talked about choosing between essential, necessary, and nice to do. We all have long lists of things that are nice to do, that we enjoy, that are fun for us. But if that's where we focus, then you're always going to be out of alignment. If you take care of the essentials every single day, that means you're on your knees every day. You're in the scriptures every day. I don't think you need a scripture plan, but if you aren't spending some time in the scriptures every day for the rest of your life, then you're not aligned. And service, those three things help align you, and then the necessary things are always going to be there. You've always got to work, you've always got to fix and cook food and clean it up, and, and don't shirk the necessaries. And then there's always time when you align yourself correctly with priorities to do the things that are enjoyable for you, that are nice to do. Another lesson is mistakes are how we learn. Some people, I think, are smart enough to live without very many mistakes. Jesus was. <laughs> but I haven't known anybody else who hasn't made mistakes. We learn from our experience and our experiences how to choose 
and how to do and be better. And learning, one example was learning Spanish. I remember my father saying that learning another language is just a simple matter of making 50,000 mistakes. So start making some. And as I traveled the world, I, I knew I needed to learn Spanish. I en ended up in Tijuana, Mexico, my first Spanish speaking assignment, speaking assignment uh, with about 900 people in attendance at a meeting, and the area president refused to provide an interpreter for me. He said, you speak Portuguese, so start in. And I said, I haven't spoken Portuguese for 40 years. <laughs> but he wrote a simple sentence that said, this is my first Spanish, my first night of speaking Spanish in my life. Everybody help. So I read that in Spanish, and the people just hooted, and everybody helped. So I'd say, como se dice, and then they'd say it. And then, como se dice, and then they'd, they taught themselves that night. But it was really a riot. <laughs> And that, after that, every day I would hand someone a piece of paper and I would say, write down my mistakes. And then I'd review my mistakes with them. Why is it this way? What should I say instead of this? And I started to learn Spanish by making a lot of mistakes. And that's what life is. We make a lot of mistakes and then the atonement liberates us to make the changes and helps us. Another lesson is that service is a purifier. I think we can learn a lot of things from lessons and from hearing people talk. But there's nothing like serving to really reveal your weaknesses and to make you humble and to teach you what your strengths are and where you can do better. And if you've been on a mission, or if you had any kind of a leadership opportunity, or any place where you've had to really reach down inside yourself, you know that it's a purifier. And it's amazing and wonderful to feel that purification and that change in yourself. And so I believe in service. Because that's where we learn where we're weak and where we're strong. And where we need, that we need to rely on the Lord hour by hour. Another lesson is that there's always a way out of a problem. And two heads on it are better than one. And one of those heads better be the Lord's. And bring in other help if you can. My husband's always said, the best part of being married is that you have two heads on every problem. And we're, we're together with the Lord on that. But um, we all have more support than we think we have. but we're never going to be able to do what has to be done on our own. Another lesson is that relationships take time and investment, and that relationships that are worth it never go smoothly, but when you work at it, the true payoff is that golden nugget of love and appreciation and that eternal nature of relationships. But relationships take time and investment. And that goes doubly true for families. There was a reason the Lord put us in families, because families are a crucible. You're close enough together that you know everybody's weaknesses and you see all their warts. And that investment takes time. And you purify one another by serving one another. The atonement needs to be in every one of those lessons. Without miracles, your own puny effort would never be enough. Our own vision is too limited. And without the Holy Ghost, you're sunk. I've been quoted as saying that the single most important skill we can acquire in this life is the ability to seek, receive, and act on revelation. And I still believe that. That without that partnership with the Holy Ghost, we are unskilled. It doesn't matter what your GPA says. So with the Lord's atoning power and the Holy Ghost, then we have this amazing partnership. Well, that's a little bit of my journey and some of what I've learned. And um, I hope that you are enjoying your mortal experience and appreciating your time at BYU and the lessons the Lord is teaching you that will be very valuable 
in the years to come. You have no idea what you're going to be called upon to do. But it's going to be a lot. And the Lord is going to need valiant servants. Just sing that little primary song all the time. The Lord needs valiant servants, and I'm going to be one. And what you're doing here is preparing you to do that. I leave you my testimony that the gospel of Jesus Christ as restored by the prophet Joseph Smith and carried on through every modern day prophet through this time, even to President Thomas Monson, is true. That it was established, this gospel and church was established by our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And their work is amazing, and it is going forth boldly and nobly. I've been out in the world, and I've seen what's happening, and it's thrilling to see what the Lord does, person by person, drop by drop, in lives that seem small, but they're huge. And I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had to see and witness the ongoing miracles of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my own life, in my family, and in the world. And I leave you my love and appreciation, and especially to my family, who've listened to many talks now. And keep coming back for more. I don't know why you do it, but I love you for it. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you want to do? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Maybe we take two or three at a time. Okay. If they have them. We have time for a few questions, and what we'll do is take two or three and then uh, give Sister Beck a chance to uh, offer answers to those questions. So, any questions? Running, running for the next class. Yeah. <laughs> Could you take a selfie with all of Take a selfie? <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you'd put it on your Facebook page, <laughs> so probably not. Thanks. Please. Um, what would you say to students who are discouraged? Okay, that's a good question. Well, there's my timer. Timer just went off. No, okay, so she asked, what would you say to uh, students that are discouraged and feel like they're just drowning in it? Okay, anybody else? I'll take two or three, and then maybe the answer will apply. Okay, advice for family members that have fallen away or are struggling. Okay, that's a great question. And then there was there another one? Okay, as a young mother, how do you let go of school while you're home with your kids? <laughs> okay, those are all different questions, but somehow related. Again, I emphasize the atonement of Jesus Christ and the spirit of revelation that is available to everybody. Because the atonement is the great healer, and discouragement is part of the mortal experience. <laughs> Sometimes we do get discouraged, and we feel like we have too much on us. And that's when you have to rely doubly on the Lord. He teaches you that. It's good to find that out, that you can't do it all yourself. And that happens in family relationships. Things take time. So that eternal perspective is that this is a moment... It's not going to be this way forever. Just put yourself in the place of a long sacrament meeting talk. You know that eventually they will say amen. <laughs> and that in the meantime, you can be patient and gracious and loving and good. And as a mother, you, that's part of what you have to learn. You have to learn to put the books in the closet and do something else and focus on the people that really matter. It's hard because women love to multitask. And you think you can do it all at once. And sometimes you can. But there are times when you need to focus with those priorities. Well, is that good? Is it time to, any, do you want any more? Or? Okay, she has one more back Let's here. One more batch, how about that? Okay. So go ahead, shout it out. Okay. 
Okay, so what did I learn from the first presidency? And then what, are you doing now? what am I doing now? Okay, and you had one? <laughs> did you have your hand up? Okay, she's putting her sweater on. Okay, what was the process of being called to the callings I have? Maybe we'll start with that. Just like you get called. You get called into the office of a presiding leader and they ask you something and you say yes. I mean, it's, <laughs> I didn't volunteer, I didn't send out a resume, I didn't say, by the way, I graduated from BYU. Uh, you just get called in and somebody asks you to do something and you say yes and then you try and fulfill that assignment to the best of your ability and like most people you usually feel very inadequate and unprepared and so then you start relying on the Lord to sort of lift you up and get you through the first steps and you fight the inertia. You think I wanted to go be the Relief Society president on the first day? I put on the song Bar J Wranglers that was back in the saddle again. And I played it as loud as I could all the way to Salt Lake <laughs> so that I would have enough energy to get up and go into the office and smile and pretend I was happy to be there. And, I, and you pretend until you feel it. And, uh, and that was okay. But my, I learned a lot from the general leaders of the church that way. I, they go through a lot of mortal challenges in their own lives too. But I learned the, the importance of keys and the Lord's power and where it rests, and how important it is for all of us to protect the keys of the prophet. I learned that lesson from the, the counselor of the first presidency and the quorum of the 12, and all the way through all the leaders in the Salt Lake. We understand that the authority to run the Lord's church, the church of Jesus Christ, comes from him, and that it's his power, and he disseminates it where and how he wants. So all of us have the responsibility and the duty to safeguard the keys of the prophet. That was an important lesson I learned. And what am I doing now? Lots of service. All kinds of service in all kinds of ways. And getting up every morning with one, two, three, four. And getting on my knees and asking the Lord, where do you want me today? Answering the phone calls and going in that direction. I love it. It's an amazing, wonderful life. Spending a lot of it with my family, and that's blessing and enriching my time. So thank you again for this opportunity. All the best. Spanish <laughs> in my life, everybody help. So I read that in Spanish, and the people just hooted, and everybody helped. So I'd say, como se dice, and then they'd say it. And then, como se dice, and then they'd, they taught themselves that night. But it was really a riot. And that, after that, every day I would hand someone a piece of paper and I would say, write down my mistakes. And then I'd review my mistakes with them. Why is it this way? What should I say instead of this? And I started to learn Spanish by making a lot of mistakes. And that's what life is. We make a lot of mistakes and then the atonement liberates us to make the changes and helps us. Another lesson is that service is a purifier. I think we can learn a lot of things from lessons and from hearing people talk. But there's nothing like serving to really reveal your weaknesses and to make you humble and to teach you what your strengths are and where you can do better. And if you've been on a mission, or if you had any kind of a leadership opportunity, or any place where you've had to really reach down inside yourself, you know that it's a purifier. And it's amazing and wonderful to feel that purification and that change in yourself. And so I believe in service. Because that's where we learn where we're weak and where we're strong, and where we need, that we need to rely on the Lord hour by hour. Another lesson is that there's always a way out of a problem. And two heads on it are better than one. And one of those heads better be the Lord's. And bring in other help if you can. My husband's always said, the best part of being married is that you have two heads on every problem. And we're, we're together with the Lord on that. But um, 
we all have more support than we think we have. But we're never going to be able to do what has to be done on our own. Another lesson is that relationships take time and investment. And that relationships that are worth it never go smoothly. But when you work at it, the true payoff is that golden nugget of love and appreciation and that eternal nature of relationships. But relationships take time and investment. And that goes doubly true for families. There was a reason the Lord put us in families, because families are a crucible. You're close enough together that you know everybody's weaknesses and you see all their warts. And that investment takes time. And you purify one another by serving one another. The atonement needs to be in every one of those lessons. Without miracles, your own puny effort would never be enough. Our own vision is too limited. And without the Holy Ghost, you're sunk. I've been quoted as saying that the single most important skill we can acquire in this life is the ability to seek, receive, and act on revelation. And I still believe that. That without that partnership with the Holy Ghost, we are unskilled. It doesn't matter what your GPA says. So with the Lord's atoning power and the Holy Ghost, then we have this amazing partnership. Well, that's a little bit of my journey and some of what I've learned. And um, I hope that you are enjoying your mortal experience and appreciating your time at BYU and the lessons the Lord is teaching you that will be very valuable in the years to come. You have no idea what you're going to be called upon to do. But it's going to be a lot. And the Lord is going to need valiant servants. Just sing that little primary song all the time. The Lord needs valiant servants, and I'm going to be one. And what you're doing here is preparing you to do that. I leave you my testimony that the gospel of Jesus Christ as restored by the prophet Joseph Smith and carried on through every modern day prophet through this time, even to President Thomas Monson, is true. That it was established, this gospel and church was established by our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And their work is amazing, and it is going forth boldly and nobly. I've been out in the world, and I've seen what's happening, and it's thrilling to see what the Lord does, person by person, drop by drop, in lives that seem small, but they're huge. And I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had to see and witness the ongoing miracles of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my own life, in my family, and in the world. And I leave you my love and appreciation, and especially to my family, who've listened to many talks now. And keep coming back for more. I don't know why you do it, but I love you for it. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Did you want to do? Sure. Maybe we take two or three at a time. Okay. If they have we have time for a few questions, and what we'll do is take two or three and then uh, give Sister Beck a chance to uh, offer answers to those questions. So, any questions? Running, running for the next class. Could you take a selfie with all of Take a selfie? Well, then you'd put it on your Facebook page. <laughs> So, probably not. Thanks. <laughs> Please. Okay, that's a good question. Well, there's my timer. Timer just went off. No, okay, so she asked, what would you say to uh, students that are discouraged and feel like they're just drowning in it? Okay, anybody else? I'll take two or three, and then maybe the answer will apply. Um, talking about relationships and how things don't go, I was really looking for people that were church. 
Okay, advice for family members that have fallen away or are struggling. Okay, that's a great question. And then there was there another one. Okay, as a young mother, how do you let go of school while you're home with your kids? <laughs> okay, these are all different questions, but somehow related. Again, I emphasize the atonement of Jesus Christ and the spirit of revelation that is available to everybody. Because the atonement is the great healer, and discouragement is part of the mortal experience. <laughs> Sometimes we do get discouraged, and we feel like we have too much on us, and that's when you have to rely doubly on the Lord. He teaches you that. It's good to find that out, that you can't do it all yourself. And that happens in family relationships. Things take time. So that eternal perspective is that this is a moment. It's not going to be this way forever. Just put yourself in the place of a long sacrament meeting talk. You know that eventually they will say amen. <laughs> and that in the meantime, you can be patient and gracious and loving and good. And as a mother, you, that's part of what you have to learn. You have to learn to put the books in the closet and do something else and focus on the people that really matter. It's hard because women love to multitask. And you think you can do it all at once. And sometimes you can. But there are times when you need to focus with those priorities. Well, is that good? Is it time to, do you want any more? Or? Okay, she has one more back Let's here. Do one more batch, how about that? Okay. So go ahead, shout it out. Okay, so what did I learn from the first presidency? What are you doing now? What am I doing now? Okay, and you had one? <laughs> did you have your hand up? Okay, she's putting her sweater on. Okay, what was the process of being called to the callings I have? Maybe we'll start with that. Just like you get called. You get called into the office of a presiding leader and they ask you something and you say yes. I mean, it's, <laughs> I didn't volunteer. I didn't send out a resume. I didn't say, by the way, I graduated from BYU. Uh, you just get called in and somebody asks you to do something and you say yes. And then you try and fulfill that assignment to the best of your ability. And like most people, you usually feel very inadequate and unprepared. And so then you start relying on the Lord to sort of lift you up and get you through the first steps and you fight the inertia. You think I wanted to go be the Relief Society president on the first day? I put on the song Bar J Wranglers that was back in the saddle again. And I played it as loud as I could all the way to Salt Lake <laughs> so that I would have enough energy to get up and go into the office and smile and pretend I was happy to be there. And, I, and you pretend until you feel it. And, uh, and that was okay. But my, I learned a lot from the general leaders of the church that way. I, they go through a lot of mortal challenges in their own lives too. But I learned the, the importance of keys and the Lord's power and where it rests, and how important it is for all of us to protect the keys of the prophet. I learned that lesson from the, the counselor of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and all the way through all the leaders in the Salt Lake. We understand that the authority to run the Lord's church, the church of Jesus Christ, comes from him, and that it's his power, and he disseminates it, where and how he wants. So all of us have the responsibility and the duty to safeguard the keys of the prophet. That was an important lesson I learned. And what am I doing now? Lots of service. All kinds of service in all kinds of ways. And getting up every morning with one, two, three, four. And getting on my knees and asking the Lord, where do you want me today? Answering the phone calls and going in that direction. I love it. It's an amazing, wonderful life. Spending a lot of it with my family, and that's blessing and enriching my time. So thank you again for this opportunity. All the best.